I mean, Chicago, they're not unreachable. No, moving on to Chicago, three and fourteen. Vegas has them at seven and a half, like you said. They were dead last in passing, so they obviously need to change that if they want to move that three and fourteen record. But they were number one in rushing yardage and number two in attempts and number one in rushing average. So obviously the seven uh, yards plus per carry from Justin Fields helped to that average for sure. Um, but Justin Fields going at QB7, 47th overall. Uh, everybody's hoping that that 2,200 yards he passed had passing last year and 70 touchdown number goes up because – I think you hit a ceiling at 1,100 yards rushing and 10 rushing touchdowns. So for him to finish at QB7, where you're drafting him at QB7, you got to – those those passing numbers need to go up because those rushing numbers are unreal. We see it with Lamar Jackson. They can't be repeated, mostly because of injury, but also it's very difficult because teams start to scheme you, and 10 rushing touchdowns is an awful lot. Now, Jalen Hurts can do it. But I'd you shave off 500 yards from that, and you got Jalen Hurts. So that's where I could see him ending. I see him ending closer to, to the rushing season Jalen Hurts had. But can he pass for the 3,200, 1,000 more yards than than uh, Jalen Hurts did? He did it in college. He's got the arm to do it. He's got the talent. But does Chicago have the firepower around him and the talent to be able to do that outside of DJ Moore? So, yeah, I mean, we, we, we talked about it before, and we talked about third-year quarterbacks coming in and getting an elite weapon at wide receiver. And people can laugh at it. People can say what they want about DJ Moore, but he's an elite weapon in this league. And he's coming from a team that stunk throwing the ball too, and he was still an elite weapon and a wide receiver won there. So, you know, Josh Allen got Stephon Diggs. Jalen Hurts got A.J. Brown, and you had two get Tyreek Hill. And look at what they did in their third year. And so... You said it. Justin Fields could throw. We saw it from him in college. We saw what he can do. We saw it last year. He threw accurate balls down the field last year. His receivers could not catch the ball. Well, he I mean, did overthrow many, Darnell how, Mooney multiple times. I wouldn't say he threw it accurately. Sure. He did have some, but again, I'm, I, I, you know, I, I can't recollect which games they were. They could have been early on in the season. But that being said, like he's proven in college he could throw the deep ball, deep ball for sure like i i'm not knocking justin fields passing ability i was knocking the receiving game of the the chicago bears last year like you're saying yeah i mean like mooney's a good receiver he's a good number 2 receiver and now he can play number 2 and dj moore's yeah. going to be the number 1 it puts him back in you know into the number 2 role it puts claypool into the slot and as a number 3 um or mooney into the slot and claypool on the outside however they want to do it DJ Moore is going to come in there and be the receptions leader. And I think it's going to help out Justin Fields a lot. I don't know if the, yeah, I mean, it's hard to say that it's, it's very hard to say that 1100 yards is, is going to be, you know, he's going to top that, but yeah, I agree. It's very difficult to get to 11, 1200 yards. Like, like Lamar he, Jackson, he could. I'm not saying he can't, but if he does, he's thicker than Lamar Jackson now. You're losing pass. Yeah. But he also took more hits than Lamar Jackson took too. Jackson's shiftier, yeah, and he's a little more explosive. Yeah. Like Fields, Fields reminds me of a little bit smaller version of Hurts. Like he can still get it done. Don't get me wrong; he's going to have those seventy-five yard rushing games, this and that. But you're going to have to have hundred yard rushing games to go for eleven hundred yards again. And if you're going to have success through the air, something's going to give, and it's going to be your rushing yardage. That being said, when it comes to red zone threat. And you, this is him and Hertz are the and and are probably the top two next to Josh Allen that are going to be those quarterback red zone threats that are going to be able to sneak in and get you the ball. Now let's talk about the the uh, Hydra that we have at the running back position here in Chicago. You cut one head off with David Montgomery and you get two with Khalil Herbert and Devonta Foreman and some question marks there. Obviously Khalil Herbert I think is going to get the first shot at this, but I'm not necessarily. Uh, convinced that it's going to be a one running back system here that I think it's going to be, they're going to use multiple different running backs. I mean, last year, Herbert only had a 20, 129 carries with Montgomery, you know, similar situation, Devontae Foreman being the bigger guy too, as well. He did have one game where he had 20 rushes and uh, he had 157 yards, two touchdowns. He was RB1 Khalil Herbert last year, but Deontay Foreman had three top seven finishes last year as well. When he came in for Carolina after, uh, Christian McCaffrey was shipped off to the 49ers. So these are both good uh, good running backs. And let's not forget the QB dual threat 
that came into Texas that was converted to a running back in Roshan Johnson. Yeah, he's dealing with a little bit of injury currently right now in training camp, but this guy is a awesome broke breaking tackle, shifty, elusive running back that can add another thing to this entire uh, offense. So I'm not saying he's going to be a three headed monster, but I I don't be surprised if you see Deontay Foreman in on the field a little bit more than you're expecting uh, for people who are drafting Khalil Herbert. Yeah, I mean, I think you, you kind of nailed it. Is uh, and uh, Khalil Herbert's going to get the first shot at this. I think he he kind of earned that in his roles the last couple of years, um, where he's been productive when he's been in there and had to spell David Montgomery. I think bringing in Deontay Foreman was a smart move. You get a veteran that has some um, that uh, is a very capable running back. You know, they didn't have to spend a lot of money bringing him in, and then you have a rookie in Roshan Johnson who I think that they're going to let him develop a little bit. Um, I think that they're going to let him come into come into his own. Um, but you're right; they have three weapons there. Um, but like, I would I still prioritize it in that order: is Khalil Herbert first, Deontay Foreman, then Roshan. Um, yeah. Roshan is a guy that's more dynasty for me. Um, I don't think he's going to make a huge impact this year. I think because they brought in Deontay Foreman, I think this is the last year of Khalil Herbert's contract. Um, yeah, so he's a sixth round might... running back too. So yeah. you know that there's not so, a lot invested in him. Yeah, so they're gonna they're gonna run him, and I think that this is the same thing we talk about when we talk about the Ravens. And do you want a piece of this backfield because of what Justin Fields is able to do? So with the the RPO and the way that Fields is dynamic as a runner, um, it's going to create that hesitation, that one or two second hesitation for the running back to be able to break free. I think Khalil Herbert and uh, Deontay Foreman, whoever is going to kind of split the carries there, and whoever's going to be in, um, is going to benefit from that. So. These guys, you don't have to go and draft like heavy. Um, these are probably going to be your RB3 or flex play, but you should want one of these two. Um, absolutely. Yeah. And because they can be, you know, if, if Khalil Herbert comes in and becomes a volume guy and is having a really good season, you know, that could be a guy that is very, very valuable on your team. If Deontay Foreman kind of takes over the role, that's they're going five picks with each, uh, from each other. So it's not like for there's a, reason. a huge difference. Yeah, in the, yeah for yeah, a I reason. I think the consensus is that they're going to be right there. Um, so, yeah, I think th I like the running back situation here. I think that they have depth there at that position. Um, and it's not going to be all volume one guy, which I think, you know, ticks off a lot of fantasy football guys because they just want to be like, who's the guy in Chicago? Like, I just want to get yeah. the guy. That's not the way it works for a lot of these teams, you know, for a lot of these guys that are rebuilding who have these six round running backs and who have depth at the position. They don't have to go and spend a lot of money and they can use a three headed monster there. I mean, we're going to see it this year with, with Philadelphia, even um, with, with Penny and Deandre Swift and Gainwell, like, you know, most teams do not have a stable running back. So, yeah, you know, you, 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 you hope that the guy, and that's why they're being drafted in the fifth and sixth round, you know, because they're not going to be the guy that's going to get heavy volume. Yeah. I think at the end of the day, uh, I'm going with Herbert or Foreman. If I really want a running back from this offense. I'm not saying I do uh, because the really the guy who's probably going to finish with the most yardage on the team is probably going to be Justin Fields um, or at least similar yardage to these other guys. Um, let's not forget Deontay Foreman when he was drafted in Houston. He played behind Lamar Miller and Lamar Miller had an okay season the year Deontay Foreman was there in 2017. But he tore his Achilles and ended up not coming back to Houston, went to Tennessee backed up Derrick Henry had a you know a couple decent showings here and there but he showed out I think last year with the Panthers I mean he had 200 attempts for 914 yards four and a half yards per carry five touchdowns now, he's not a receiving guy so I think you're going to see him when you do on more short yardage some you know later on games to give breathers and who knows again I don't think anybody's earned the, this role as RB1 but obviously Khalil Herbert's got the first shot at it um, yeah, let's talk about the receiving core here. Cause there's three big names on this offense, which one of them possibly honestly could be at the end of the training camp may not even be a Chicago bear. We'll see what happens with chase Claypool, but DJ Moore coming from Carolina, having decent years in Carolina is now all of a sudden in Chicago last year being his worst year in Carolina, uh, to be honest, had uh 63 catches for 888 yards, uh, Let's see, three out of the four last weeks were his best of the, of the whole season. He was wide receiver 11, wide receiver 8, and wide receiver 4. So 
there's there was a shining moment for him at the end of the year in Carolina, but I think everybody kind of had a feeling midseason that his numbers in Carolina were up, that he was going somewhere else at some point. Yep. Chicago is a, a place where he automatically still remains the number one. But in my opinion, does his role, and this is my question to you, in Chicago really change from what it was in in Carolina? Does his potential truly change he's always been a thousand yard receiver and been around that four or five yard four or five touchdown i think last year was the first time he went over four or five touchdowns with seven what what's your thought here are you buying into the dj Moore hype is he finally going to have his wide receiver one finish not one overall but wide receiver one finish or is he going to be dj Moore wide receiver two underwhelming as he has been his entire career well i mean you're drafting him as a number two. So I think that's what you're going to get from him. He's not going to be, you know, this wide receiver one that's going to be a top 12 receiver in the league, but you're drafting him as being a top 20 or right, you know, right around that. And um, yeah, he's a wide yeah, receiver I think 20. He, yeah. And I, I think that's exactly what you can expect from him. I think his, again, I, I, I really do think that in the third year when you get a, an elite talent, which DJ Moore is an elite talent, he's never been on a team that likes to throw the ball. And you look at a lot of these guys and, you know, they're when they're when these good wide receivers are stuck on teams that can't throw the ball or can't or have a bad offense or or run first teams like they their numbers don't show and accurately reflect who they are. And so I don't think it's fair to say, you know, DJ Moore is like what quarterback has he had there that's really been lighting things up? Baker Mayfield. We know historically Baker Mayfield cannot sustain deep deep ball receivers. And DJ Moore can go and, and win the deep ball. We've seen it. On Hail Marys, we've seen it at end, ends of games. Like he can go up, go up there and win it. So I, I think this is going to really benefit uh, Justin Fields a lot. And I think that the touchdown numbers are going to go up. I think he's still around that eight touchdown mark, and I think that's realistic for him. I think around a, a thousand yards, and you know, is is, is can he reach fifteen hundred yards? No, I don't think so. Can he reach thirteen hundred yards? I pre- very unlikely. But can he get 1,100 yards? Sure. Like, I think that's very realistic for him. Um, I mean, that's been his ceiling. That is gonna... Yeah, but you're drafting him as that. Like, again, yeah. you're, if you're drafting him to be a 1,400-yard guy, and you're dra- you'd are you be drafting him in the second round, right? In the first yeah, no. and second round. Well, the, the only thing I will say about DJ Moore, so you're, you're right about the quarterback play. Uh, you know, Cam Newton would have been there in 2020 for him. And he, Dead arm? He, no, well, he ended up having that foot injury and he never came back. He went yeah. to the Patriots after that and everything there. But 2019, Cam Newton, uh, or sorry, it was 2019. Uh, 2020 was Teddy Bridgewater. Um, 2018, he had Cam Newton, but he was a rookie that season. He only got 55 receptions. Um, so he only finished with 788 yards. But here's the problem that I see with DJ Moore. And this is the thing that's a sticking point for me and my argument against him year after year. And which is why I've always avoided him after that 29th season, uh, 2019 season, is he has yet to have a 100-catch season as a wide receiver one. And yet he is getting massive amounts of targets every single season. We're talking 135, 118, 163, 118. And he's not even getting like the closest he was with the 163 targets. And he had 93 catches. I mean, that to me, if you want to be a wide receiver one in this NFL league, you get 163 targets, you better catch 120 of those things. You know what I mean? So I mean, the number two off most, most people's board had that numbers last year and people still, still are still drafting them. Jamar Chase. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You, you know, so that's what I'm saying. One, so 143 targets, only 83 receptions, 82 receptions. So, you know, yeah, I mean, you can, I, I get the argument for DJ Moore, but it, my argument my counter argument to that is that you're not drafting him to be Jamar Chase. You're not drafting him to be a first round quarter, first round wide no. receiver. So is he going to, is he the, let me answer me this. Is he the best wide receiver on that team? Yes. He's the best wide receiver on the team. Yeah. But here's, but here again, is I, he going to help I mean, here, Justin Fields develop as a thrower? He should, he should. Well, here, but here's the question. Is he really going to, and, and this is what I, I want to ask everybody out there listening when you've got a 57% completion percentage with 163 targets, yeah, I'm, I'm not assuming all those are catchable balls, but that being said, 163 targets, 
Like that is not somebody making your quarterback better, in my opinion. Especially in 2021, when you're when you're looking at the quarterback play that he was having. I mean, even at 118 targets the year before, he only had 66 receptions. Like his 135 the year before in 2019, he had 87 catches. Like those totals, like he's pretty much at a 50% catch percentage. You go and look at all the wide receiver ones on their teams and how much more they catch the ball for their quarterbacks. That's what what scares me. I guarantee, you, like I haven't looked it up yet, but I'll, I'll pull it up while we, while you you're talking here a little bit about uh, Darno Mooney and Chase Claypool. But I guarantee you, Chase Claypool probably has a better catch percentage over his career than than DJ oh, Moore has. I guarantee look you, he up. does. I will. I will look it up quickly because I'm, I'm I won't I won't spend too much time on Claypool and Mooney. Uh, Claypool don't want him part of Mooney. I would go and draft at his ADP. Um, I think that, again, he's now coming out of the number one role and going into a number two role. He is a dynamic playmaker, um, especially what he can do on the short yardage, just get the ball into his hands and let him do the rest. Uh, I think DJ Moore being on the other side is going to help him out. Um, and I think that they have to, again, if this team is going to if, if this team is going to be effective, they're going to have to throw the ball. They can't rely on Justin Fields to run for 1,100 yards every season on this. So... Uh, you know, those are my those are my thoughts on them. Like, I, I want I want nothing to do with anyone else on on this receiving core other than DJ Moore and then Darnell Mooney much later. Uh, All right, so Chase Claypool and DJ Moore are pretty pretty equal. Fifty nine percent career uh, catch percentage for DJ Moore, uh, fifty seven for Claypool, but it was a forty eight percent in Chicago last year with the way that passing game was. He had sixty four percent coming over from Pittsburgh. Till he got traded. Uh, so again, this is the concern I have for Justin Fields is the weapons he has behind him. Are do you you don't you're not having the hands of uh Justin Jefferson, you're not having the hands of Cooper Cup, you're not having the hands of Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle and Devonta Smith and AJ Brown, these guys who are sure-handed guys that are gonna really help your team out where they're not even D hop where you can throw a ball around him and he's going to catch the ball. Like these guys are going to have to get open and Justin Fields is going to have to be an accurate passer for this to be a successful offense on the field. And that's my concern with this team. Um, Cole Komet is probably the best guy, uh, the best receiver on the team last year. He had uh, 50 receptions, 544 yards and seven touchdowns. Obviously at the tight end position, he didn't do the volume that DJ Moore had, um, but he did better than Mooney and Claypool last year. And Claypool also, don't forget, was not there the entire time. Um, so I think Claypool full season would have been much better. Um, however, he had two weeks where he had multiple touchdowns, two touchdowns, and five weeks where he was at the tight end 11 or better. And two of them, he was tight end one. So he's another guy who's kind of at the top of that list with Dolchich and those guys on, if you miss the big, uh, top tiers. Here's one of the first guys you're going to try and grab, maybe grab off the board. But again, there's so many down there. Any of them could hit. I mean, you just yeah. like the fact that they paid this man. They paid this man the money. So um, sometimes money talks. Sometimes money plays. Some, but still, you're at not, the end of the you're day, you're not going to do a you're not going to do a really bad Russian accent with that. No, pay this man his money. Pay him. <laughs> pay him. Pay pay his pay this man his money. <laughs>